Let me introduce, in the meantime, our next speaker. It's Björn Faller. Björn works for NetInsight, where he wears many hats, including mentor trainer, troubleshooter, networking protocol designer, software architect, programmer, and he's continuously pushing the code base to increasingly modern C++. Programming has been his full-time profession since graduating from university in 1994. He was there mostly writing embedded software for networking equipment. Bjorn first experienced programming when home, aha, sorry, Bjorn first experienced programming when home computers became popular in the early 80s, 80s, and it quickly became a permanent interest of his. Occasionally, our speaker has been tinkering with unorthodox software construct, pondering what can be done with this? Right now, he lives in, Stock in Stockholm. Stockholm. <laughs> Great applause, big applause for Bjorn, our speaker after the lunch break. <laughs> Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, so, where is my presentation? I have it on the monitor here. Um. <laughs> Ah. It, works it works now. now. Okay. okay. Good. <laughs> okay, that was a good start. Uh, yes, so welcome to this presentation, More Functional with C23. Um, this presentation is primarily not very advanced C, but it is pushing the limits of what the language can do, pretty much. Uh, and the things that aren't advanced. It's probably very unfamiliar to most of you, so you will probably leave this room and feeling that your synapses are hurting a little bit. Sorry. And towards the very end, the, the code will be advanced, just so you know. You have been warned. Uh, the title, More Functional, came out because I actually did a talk on this topic in uh, 2018. Not here, though, unfortunately. But a lot has happened since 2018. Uh, the core language has definitely evolved. It's not a lot of changes, but they are very significant. The standard library has evolved enormously since then. And I have, I have evolved. I have learned. I have new experiences. So I thought it's time to revisit the, the topic and see what can we do now. So I want to start with uh, a question, so just shout out answers. What are some main differences between the function template func here and the lambda? Some suggestions? Sorry? Lambda is no except by default, yes. Uh, some, I heard something up. You cannot overload a lambda. That is, that is true. That is true. Uh, which is actually a very interesting bit, because you can, you can actually argue that this lambda is extremely overloaded, because this t can be anything. Uh, what I'm thinking of is primarily this, that func is not a thing. It's a template for things. You, you cannot get a pointer to func. You can get a pointer to func of some type, but not in general. Whereas lambda is one object with several overloaded function call operators, one for every type t. <coughs> and th this is actually a significant difference, because since you can take the address of a lambda, you can pass the lambda as one object to a higher-order function. Now, time for the definition. A higher-order function is a function that returns a function or, and or accepts functions as parameters. And for the purpose of this presentation, when I say function, I mean anything that is callable. It can actually be a function. It can be a function pointer. It can be any 
object of a type that has a function call operator, and it will almost always be a lambda. So now we have set the terminology scope here. But this difference makes uh, this difference is significant because since there is no name for the overload set of specializations for func, it means that we cannot just in general pass func to higher order functions. But lambda is the name for all overloaded function call operators. And that which means that we can pass it to a higher order function. So let's start with a simple example. Using, uh, using ranges here, we want to check if all values in a range are positive. So stood ranges all of R and this lambda compares each, each value of E is greater than zero. OK, this is fine. Uh, I've written code like this many times. I presume you have written similar code several times. But it's noisy. I think. I think it's noisy. Uh, we can do something more interesting. Writing, writing a higher order function greater than that accepts something that we call RH. And when called, it returns a lambda that captures this RH. So we have an indirection here. And when that lambda is, in turn is called with an LH, we return the result of comparing the direct function call operator with the f function call argument, sorry, with the captured R value RH. So now we can write like this. Returns to ranges all of R greater than zero. I get absolutely giddy with joy when I see code like this, because this communicates the way we speak as humans. We say, I want to check if all the values in R are greater than zero. Your product manager understands this code. Uh, so when we say greater than zero here, we evaluate this greater than function call, and the result of that is this lambda, where r h is zero. We can implement this in, a, in another way, using more standard library features to say, uh, there's a library uh, thing added called bind back. Bind back takes something that is callable and some arguments. Uh, you can see how it looks here. The, what happens is that when you call bind back, you get something back that is in its turn callable. And, and when you call it, it will call the function with whatever arguments you add to, to that call. And then at the end, to the very tail, you had the arguments that you had in the bind back call. So this, this is the same thing, but with std greater. So what happens here when I write it now? Every value from R is called with std greater value and zero. So synonymous solution, uh, except everything here is just a combining stuff from the standard library. Sadly, bind back is missing in most standard library implementations today. But we can make one. It's actually not very difficult. Uh, this is a, admittedly, this one is a bit naive, but it works. We have bind back. It takes f as a function and the value rh. We return a, a lambda that captures f and rh. And when that lambda in turn is called, we re return the result of calling f with lh and rh. And then we can implement all the other functions. Less than, uh, equal to, less not equal, etc., etc., Because they are, they are useful. All right. So let's go to another problem. We have a sequence of numbers. 1, 3, 8, 2, 3, 8, 1. And I want to calculate a new sequence that is the difference between all these numbers. So one good helper from the ranges library is uh, views pairwise. Pairwise makes a new sequence of reference to neighboring elements in the sequence. So it will be called with it will pass on a sequence containing reference to 1, 3, 3, 8, 8, 2, 
two, three, three, eight, eight, one, like so. And there are other. Uh, there are many other views in uh, in the ranges library that obviously do different things, but also pass tuples, you know, tuples of reference. That, that is a very common thing in uh, in ranges. So how do we get from from these tuples of pairs to calculate the difference? Well, we can go to ranges transform. We know that we will be called with uh, a, a tuple containing t references to two values. So we can use structure binding to destructure it and get the values a and b. That makes it a little bit easier to read the code. And then we return b minus a. And now we have the sequences. We have the sequence of differences. So that is good. But this is a little bit of an eyesore, I think, because we, if you are you familiar with using ranges, uh, a bit reluctant, but quite a few hands anyway. Uh, this is a pattern that repeats often because there are there are many many views that give you uh, tuples of references. So so you get this, get a tuple, destructure it, do something, and it, it, it's noise. So. I was wondering, can we use std apply? std apply has been with us since C17. It's a function, function template in, in the standard library that takes something that is callable and a tuple, and then when called with a callable and a tuple, it will, it will make the call with every element in the, in the tuple. And that seems to match what we have here. We, we, we want to call something that takes b minus a where B and A comes from a tuple. So unfortunately, we cannot do that uh, right away with uh, std apply, but we can make our own apply. Uh, here's a new thing, if you're not familiar with it, from C++23, you can, you can have an explicit type name for the, the types uh, in the argument list. Earlier, you had to write auto and uh, a lot of decal types. But here, type name F. And we can use that. So we return a lambda that captures f by perfect forwarding, in case it is expensive or maybe impossible to copy. And then when it is called with the tuple t, we call std apply with, um, with the function and, uh, and that tuple. All right? So given that apply. We can now write like this. Ranges use transform apply of this lambda that takes an A and a B and returns a difference. And I like this. There's much less noise. But I cannot help but wonder, the library has the minus. Can we, can, can we, can we use the minus? Naively just chugging std minus there would return a minus b, though. That is the exact opposite of what we want. Uh, is there a way to rearrange the order of arguments to in, in a function call? I don't know of any in the standard library anyway, so I created one. Swizzle. I'm coming back to that name. Uh, Swizzle can be called with a function, like before, and you specify a, a number of indexes, these uh, size t i's, and the way that I intend this to function is that you, you call Swizzle angle brackets and the indices of the function, of the arguments you want, the function. And if you, in this case, call Swizzle 201 with, with string 3 and null putter, it becomes a call to a function of null put string and three, because the first argument in the angular brackets number number two is the last argument, so that is null putter, so it becomes first. The second is zero, which is the, the first and therefore string, and the third is one, which is the digit three. So how can we create something like this? Well, 
as before, we have this lambda that captures a function, and it is callable by a number of t's, whatever that is. And uh, we create a, a tuple with uh, references, L-value references and R-value references to all the arguments, t's, all the t's. And then we call the function, and we use to get of each of the index because we, we have access to the indexes also in this uh, inner lambda, to get them in the desired order with the, with the tuples. Now, this looks a little bit dangerous, calling std move on each and every argument. But uh, remember that the tuple itself is just a tuple of references. The only thing we do, only reason to do move here is to ensure that uh, if it has captured an R-value reference, stud-get will give you an R-value reference. This is dangerous if you would repeat the same, uh, the same argument several times, like Swizzle 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and each and, each and every one of them is a, a, a unique pointer. Then only the first one will get a value, the others will be... Uh, no, no, don't do that. But this works. And maybe you want to restrict it using, using concepts or requires clause and say that each and every index in I must be less than the total number of arguments in T's. Because if you have a number here that is larger than the number of T's, then you will get a compilation error somewhere deep inside the implementation of stud-get, and I'm sure no one will be happy about that. You may also perhaps want to place a constraint that f is actually callable by the arguments in that order. This is an interesting design trade-off. If you don't do that, if you leave it like this and you make a mistake, you will get a compilation error saying that I don't know how to handle this. You are calling printf with the floating point number as the first argument. But if you do make that constraint, then it's more SVNI friendly, which may be important in some cases. But you will only get a message saying that the is, is invocable constraint is not fulfilled. You don't know why. Swings around about. OK, so with this, we can make this wonderful things. Apply Swiss of 1, 0 to the minus. I think that is cool. I also think that it's extremely exaggerated for this tiny example. <laughs> Don't do this. <laughs> but it has happened to me more than once that I have something that, that I need to register a callback, and I have exactly the function, but it just doesn't have the arguments in the right order. And here's a way to get around that. OK, on to something else. As was mentioned in the introduction, most of my career has been in networking. IP addresses are a natural thing to use. An IPv4 address is a 32-bit integer. They are almost always referred to in, in human-readable terms as four bytes, numbers between zero, zero through 255. Sometimes you want to add them as actually a numerical value, so we have these two constructors. You also want to be able to compare them for equality. And there is something really cool in, the, in this tiny little line. Since C++20, if you're not familiar with it, you can just write equal default. That is the one cool thing. It means the compiler will generate an, an equality comparison operator for you that it goes member-wise. And that is okay in this situation, just we have one member, it's num, that is exactly what we want. The other cool thing is that since C++20, if you have operator equal equal, you have operator not equal also, the compiler just takes care of that for you. So we've reduced a lot of noise compared to earlier versions of C++. Another important thing in uh, IP addressing is a net mask. The way you use a net mask is uh, it's a binary mask that you do bitwise and with. 
and you say that one address masked with one mask and another address masked with the same mask, they belong to the same subnet if they are equal. So we say that, yeah, we implement that in terms of IP address, uh, get, the, get the same constructors and the bitwise AND operator. All right? That just returns the numeric result of a bitwise AND of uh, the number member. So now I can write some a function like this, a higher order function to check if addresses match. So we return IP, IP matches takes an address and a net mask to compare with. We default it to uh, all ones, so we get an exact comparison, ex exact equality. Return a lambda that captures the, the desired IP address and the mask, and when called with another IP address, we return re the result, as I said, of the desired address masked equals the actual address masked. Do you see the pattern that I've been repeating in every example so far? Returning, returning functions, yes. You write something that is callable, it takes arguments, you return a lambda that captures those arguments. And when called with something, you do something with the captured values and the arguments of the call. That is indeed the, the pattern. And that, that is essentially the whole presentation. You can go home now. <coughs> so we can use it like this. If we have a bunch of addresses, we find if IP matches the 192, 168 subnetwork. I like this. This is the way, if you talk to anyone who works with, uh, with IP networking, they will understand right away exactly what is intended here. Also, I don't only work with uh, networking itself, but with actually making networking equipment. So we need to keep track of various IP interfaces. So you realize that this is completely made up. But so something like this, we, ha we have an IP interface, it, it has a state, it can be on and off. It has an address, it has a net mask, a gateway. It would have a, have a bunch of other things. But now I want to be able to use, I want to be able to ask queries in ranges of IP interfaces in a, easy to express way. So, for example, I, I, I want to have a get state that if called with an IP interface, I get the state of the IP interface. So, enter memfn from the standard library. Uh, memfn, when called with a pointer to a member, will return something that is callable. And when that callable is called with a reference or a pointer or something pointer-like, like a smart pointer or an iterator, it will call the member function on that object. So in this case, get state of some well, pointer reference iterator to an IP interface object becomes a call to that object dot state. This is useful. So now add get address, get mask, get gateway, a little bit more complicated. We also want to be able to set state. So now we need to store the state to set. So welcome again, our friend bind back. We call bind back with memfn of set state that expects to be called with an IP interface and a state. And th that state is exactly what has been bound back. So the usage is that you call set state on and you call the result of that with uh, a pointer or a reference to an IP interface, and it will call set state on on that object. So now, how can we find how can we find an IP interface in a range given that we have an IP address? Well, what I want to do is like this: if, if I have a function f1 that takes a y and returns a z, and I have another function f2 of, that takes an x and return a y. I, I want a composition. 
I want to generate a composition that takes an x and returns a z by calling f1 of the result of calling f2 of x. So if, for example, f2 is get address and f1 is IP matches, then we're home dry. So how can we do this? Well, this is my new code formatting. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think this is going to catch on. It's really good. Uh, so I have compose that takes two functions, f1 and f2. We capture those. That is our pattern in this presentation. When called, it calls f1 of f2 of the t's. Nothing unexpected here. Let's uh, be a little bit more like serious uh, library programmers and be more careful with uh, deductions, uh, etc. So start with uh, returning a decal typo. It may return a reference, and we don't want that to decay to uh, a copy. Enter some uh, perfect forwarding for our functions f1 and f2, and some perfect forwarding for the arguments to the call also. So, yeah, a whole wall of angle brackets, ampersands, and dots. C++. And I'm sorry. Uh, in functional program, a uh, family of higher order functions that deals purely only with composing functions is called combinators. Okay? And there are many well-known combinators. And by the way, I, I strongly recommend that you watch this talk by Connor Hoekstra that he held this summer in uh, Toronto, where he goes through a plethora of ways to compose functions in several different programming languages. It's an awesome talk. But the reason for my rant is that all these well-known combinators, they have names like B, C star, O, F, double star, J, and uh, or ornithological equivalents. Bluebird cardinal once removed, owl finch twice removed, J. Yeah, the bird J for the letter J is cute, I, I, I admit. But uh, seriously, there is even a pages like this that lists how you can find the different combinators, what they are called, which birds and which letters. The one I wrote is the B combinator, the blue bird combinator, by the way. I, I am not writing blue bird in my code, nor am I writing capital B. Saved a little bit by mathematics, though, where we say that functional composition is an operation, the, the ring operator that you might remember, that takes two functions and does exactly the composition that I did. So I'm sticking with the compose, I'm sorry. Though I compose is actually a bad name also, because there are many ways to compose functions. This is but one way. But it beats Bluebird. So now we can write something like this. Range is find if interface is the composition of IP matches the, uh, this IP address and, and get address. That is cool. But we can do one better. We can give that a name, because this will occur several places in, uh, in our code base. So we have with, with address that takes an address and a net mask, and it returns this composition that is uh, exactly the same. So now I can write, find if interfaces with address 192, 168, This is beautiful code. But what if I want to search for more than one criteria? I want to search if it matches an address and if it uh, is off, maybe? How can I do that? Nothing particularly new under the sun here. We create a when all that takes a bunch of functions. New C++23 syntax to capture whole uh, parameter packs. Uh, in this case, with perfect forwarding. This syntax, it, to me, feels a bit backwards, but you, you get used to it. It beats uh, having to resort to storing stuff in, in tuples, which we had to do uh, up until now. And then return the result of a fold, fold expression folding over uh, logical and of call of f, all the f's 
with all the T's. Mind you, here you do not want to do perfect forwarding of the T's, because what if the first, the fir the, if the first one then consumes them so that the, the, the rest of the functions that comes after will get moved from objects? That is probably not what you want. So keep them const here. You're just asking a question. You, you don't want to change things here. So with that, I add a new one with state to, to see if, if a state equals the one I'm looking for. And now we can do something that, in my opinion, is pretty damn cool. So I have a function activate that takes a span of interfaces. I have an address and a net mask to search for and say, I want to activate all, all IP interfaces that match this address and net mask that are off. So we do a filter view when all with state off and with address and mask matching. And then we have all these interfaces to activate. So for each to activate, set state on. Cool stuff. Slight change of topic. Are you familiar with the optional? OK, hands are still going up. Good. Most of you are. So optional has been with us since C17, I believe, but it got a facelift in uh, 23. We got three new member functions, and then transform or else. And then, is, uh, if the optional holds a value, so all of these three functions, they take a function that takes a T. If uh, and then holds, if the optional holds a value and you call and then, then that function will be called with that value. And that function must return an, another option, optional U. U may be T, it doesn't have to be T. If the optional did not hold a value, then the result of and then will be an empty optional of U instead. Transform is very similar, except that the function just returns a U. And the result will then be either an empty optional of U or an optional of U that holds the value that was returned by the function. Or else is not to be seen as the ugly threat of give me this value or else. Uh, it's rather, if you don't have a value, call this function. And this is extremely useful in situations like cache lookups. Find object in cache or else create it, for example. So how can we use these additions? Well, we, ha we have some constraints, first of all. With optional, t cannot be a reference for the moment. You can work around that with uh, using a std reference wrapper. It makes the code more noisy, but it does the job. t cannot be void. Hmm? And there is no workaround for that. And here's a philosophical question that we can discuss over some beers. What would optional void mean if it were allowed? But this means that the function that you call to transform cannot return void. It must return something. Which means that in this case, if I want to transform set state, this won't work, because then we would get uh, an optional void, which we cannot have. So we can modify set state to return state type, the, the previously held state, for example. And now it works. So. A little bit too noisy code, but we have a, a function find interface that takes a sp span of interfaces and some predicate. And it will return an optional reference to an IP interface. So if, if, the, if the predicate matched something, then we will get a reference to that IP interface. And if it did not, we get null opt. All right? So now we can write something that I think is really neat. We find an interface 
get an optional reference. Call transform if it had a value, so then we set, set its state to on. And then I chose to just return has value as a way to signal to the caller that, yeah, we, we found one and we turned it on. I think that's cute. And now we come to the seriously advanced bit of this. This is uh, the most amazing, I think, addition to C++ 23. Uh, explicit object parameter. Uh, it's a small addition that I bet will have a huge impact on code. Uh, there will be several conference talks about this feature on its own, I, I guarantee it, and there will be blog posts about it. It's currently available in MSVC and has been for some time. It is available in Clang main if you compile from sources. It actually landed in, in Clang main only a few weeks ago. It's that recent, so it's not in any released version. It is not yet available in GCC. The last time I looked, development was in progress, but not yet merged to main. That was a few days ago, so maybe it has changed. What this is, is that it allows you to know the, well, one of many things it does. It allows you to know the qualification of the object that a function was called with. So by, allow, by allowing this as an explicit template parameter, if, if you're familiar with uh, programming in Python, you know that member function always have a self first parameter. And this is similar, but this can also be templated so that we can know the, the type, and th this, is, this is awesome. And a very useful companion function is uh, stood forward like. I will get to that one soon. So the way it works is like this. We, ha we have some, this is nonsense just to demo. We have some f. Here is the syntax for uh, getting the, uh, the type of this. Normally we don't know the type of uh, uh, a lambda. And we get it as an R value reference, or a forwarding reference rather, so we can interrogate it and see if, how it is called. So we can write something like this. Is this const, write const. If it is an L value reference, write one ampersand. And if it's not an L value, it's probably an R value. So let's write two ampersands. So we can have f like this, call, call f like, like this. So if we just call the naked f, we write one ampersand. It was called as a non-const L value, or as a const L value. And if I move it, we see that it is called as an R value, or this abomination as a const R value. This can be tremendously useful. Let's talk about curry. And I'm not talking Indian food. Uh, in mathematics and computer science, and currying is the technique of translating the evaluation of a function that takes multiple arguments into evaluating a sequence of functions, each with a single argument. In uh, functional programming languages, you functions typically are curried. If, if, if you have a function that takes three arguments, you call it with warm, you get something back that can be called with two arguments. If you call that with one argument, you get something back that can be called with one argument. If you call that with one argument, then something happens. We don't have that in C++. Functions are not curried, but we can create something that curries functions. The name curry, by the way, comes from mathematician uh, Haskell Curry. Uh, yeah, the programming language Haskell comes from the first name. As I said, functions aren't curried. We can we can create it. Let's do that. So I want something like this. If, if I have this function func that takes an int, a string, and a double, and I want to create a curried function, and then I can call the curried functions with one, I can call the, the result of that with hello, and I can call the result of that with 1.9. That is what I want to achieve. Hold on to your hats. There will be many ampersands and dots and angle brackets. <laughs> Here. This is the best code formatting, I promise. So, curry, it takes a function, and we see that we 
capture the curry itself first, uh, deducing it as a reference, and then we capture it so that we, the, the lambda can call itself recursively. Have you tried calling, making recursive lambdas? Did you have fun? It's possible without, but with this, it's easy. OK, so we can call curry recursively. We have a function that we capture with the perfect forwarding. We can then do a, a const expert check if can f be called with the t's? If it can be, let's call f with the t's. If it cannot, apply curry recursively and say, bind from the, the function that we got in the argument list and the t's. So if, if this function f that took three arguments is called with one argument, we see that no, it cannot be called. So we bind from the function and the first argument and curry that in our turn. Enter some nice ampersands and stuff. We deduce self here so that we know if this inner lambda is called as an R value or as an L value, const or non-const. And now we can use forward like. So we can say, if, if this inner lambda itself is an R value, it's going to die. We may as well forward f as an R value. And the same goes with the captured values. So, and that is what most forward like is. If self is an R value, then forward this uh, as, cost this to an R value. If self is an L value, forward this as an L value. Forward f as an L value, sorry. And then perfect forwarding of the arguments. Are your synapses hurting yet? Let's um, actually have a look at. Let's have a look at this. So I have. I have this curry here. Oh look, I have a bug. Capture by value. Yeah, that is one thing. When you're writing higher order functions like this, be extremely careful with capturing by reference. It's, uh, th that is the one thing that will cause difficult to trace down bugs. Don't do that. Yeah, so we have our curry here. I have main. I call curry on this lambda that takes three arguments A, B, C. They are meant to be pointers, so I dereference them and then return the sum of the dereferencing. And to make things a little bit curious, I have this mk here that whatever it's called with, I make a, make a unique pointer to it, just to get something that is not copyable. So I can call func f of, f is now the curried function, f of all the three arguments, and it just makes a call. Or f of two functions, two arguments, and then the third. Or it may be f of one and the two, two remaining, or with each of them individually. Just to show one thing here, what is happening, if I say, how uh, do fc is? There, one, and then we call fc with these. Now, we get a compilation error. And the reason for this is that fc has captured a unique pointer. And it must pass those by, must pass it by value to this inner function. And it cannot do that. So we get, get an error message that is not as clear as I would like it to be. But we can see the unique pointer being the problem here. So we can solve this by calling to say that this one is dying now. So it's OK for what it is uh, as an R value. The second thing I wanted to show you is if I just remove the I.O. Fingers crossed. Uh, compilers are amazing. 
through all these recursive lambdas, perfect forwarding, bind front, unique pointers forwarded, the compiler just says, eh, I know what you're doing. You're adding one, two, and three. I can do that. Compilers are amazing. So to summarize, higher order functions in general and functional composition in particular is extremely powerful. You, 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 you can mix and match things as you like. Bind back, bind front, and curried functions help a lot. They are very suitable with new library features like ranges, optional T, expected TE. Uh, expected is like optional, but you get an excuse when you don't have a value. New language features like uh, variadic lambda capture uh, and uh, uh, explicit object parameter really, really, really like makes life easier. Be very careful with capturing by reference. That's going to be painful. And explicit object parameter is a new superpower. Read about that in Cy Brand's blog post. It's amazing. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'll be around if you want to ask questions in the corridor or in the, at the dinner later. Yes, exactly. That's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you, Björn, for your amazing <laughs> presentation. Our speaker is, uh, is willingly, is wi I mean, our speaker will be very happy to answer any of your questions. Right now we have like three minutes for very quick two questions on a long one one. If you want to answer your question, please raise your hand. Is there anybody? Okay, here we have one person. Okay. Okay, hi. Uh, uh, as we can, uh, as we could see, that the using all this carrying and stuff like that is isn't really nice. It's it can be not really readable in some instances. Is there any hope in, for the future that it will be made easier? Like the functions you've got here, maybe some helper functions in in SD library. Is there any chance that things can become easier in the future? I, th I would like to say yes, but uh, I mean, I, I don't know. We're talking about the future. But uh, if we're looking at the past 10 years or so, things have become easier with every new release uh, of the standard. So probably. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Bjorn, once again. OK.